I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, virtually every day, are the words, Black Lives Matter. Those words have become emblematic of a movement within America and throughout the world that's seeking to address the issue of racism that still infects societies around the globe. There are some who act as if the phrase Black Lives Matter is in some way offensive. Offensive because it seems to minimize the importance of all lives. All lives matter, so of course Black Lives Matter. But the significance of the phrase Black Lives Matter is not to denigrate the value of other lives. Rather, the phrase implies an additional word, the word to, T-O-O, as in also. The movement is saying, Black Lives Matter too. And that's because there are ways in which the African American community and people of color in general feel they are not accorded the same respect or treated with the same dignity as is the general white population. And at the moment, this feeling is especially directed at police departments in America, which are being cast as racist institutions which single out blacks for harassment and at times brutality. So the wanton murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis policeman has sparked a national uprising led by Black Lives Matter, but supported by Americans of all colors and ethnicities, especially by younger Americans in their 20s and 30s, who now argue that there must be a major change in American society. And who can argue with that goal? This country would be more true to its founding principles of freedom and justice for all if no group was unfairly treated or targeted or brutalized. But sadly, the legitimacy of the Black Lives Matter movement has been marred by three glaring flaws. First, the organization has become the sacred cow of contemporary American counterculture. It is virtually forbidden for one to question the structure or leadership or goals of Black Lives Matter. Second, the movement, often referred to as BLM, has mushroomed into an assault on the foundations of the American social experiment. It's not that BLM wants to correct or improve the American system. There's a tragic demonization of America and of its institutions, and a call to a form of social revolution. And as true of all revolutions throughout history, many use this as a justification for violence. And the meaningful, responsible protest movement has devolved into a mob. And mobs are never good. Mobs never build. Mobs only destroy. And mobs are inevitably led by people who ultimately exploit those in the mob. And the third glaring flaw that mars the Black Lives Matter movement, especially for Jews, is that there is a serious undercurrent of anti-Semitism and a vilification of the State of Israel. How very 
very sad that the Black Lives Movement needs to ally itself with people who see Jews and Israel as the enemy. And for American Jewry and for world Jewry, this is no trivial matter. Now, one group in Israel that's been monitoring the anti-Semitic and anti-Israel strains within Black Lives Matter is the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs in Jerusalem. And I'm so pleased to have two members of the JCPA with us from Israel. One, I'm pleased to say, is a friend. He's the former Secretary General of the World Jewish Congress. He's also now a research fellow at the International Institute for Counterterrorism at the IDC in Herzliya. And he is the director of the Political Warfare Project at the JCPA, Dan Diker. And Dan is also joined by the director of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel, IBSI, Joshua Washington. And Dan and Joshua, thank you so much for joining us here on JBS. A pleasure to see both of you. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks for having us, Mark. By the way, Josh, I must ask you, I see behind you a menorah. What's yeah. your personal story, Josh, in, a, <clears throat> in just a moment? Sure. Um, so I grew up in a, in a Christian household, but my parents, they taught us to have an appreciation for the, the Jewish roots of our faith. Um, so we, we had this understanding that without the Jewish faith, there wouldn't be a Christian faith. Um, and we also, as Christians, we observe some of the, the, the feasts as well, including Hanukkah. Um, and and uh, so, yeah, so we have, you know, Hanukkah, Hanukkah and a menorah in our house. And so yeah, I have one on my piano right behind me. Very good. Now, so. Josh, what is the organization you're with? Um, and it's called the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. It goes by the letters I-S-B-I. I what is that? So um, IPSI is a media and information organization. So we, we really emphasize uh, providing other organizations with uh, content. With um, It's like a library resource. And it, it, it started because my, my father's one who founded it. And it, he founded it because he happened to stumble upon some old documents in a library of a civil rights pro-Israel organization in the 60s um, that, that was led by Dr. King's right-hand man, Bayard Rustin. And the, orga the organization doesn't exist anymore, but, but my father started Ipsy in that honor. That's kind of how we got started Very about lovely. eight years ago. Very lovely. to him. And where are you speaking to me from exactly? I know it's your home, but where? Yeah, uh, I'm in uh, North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, so Dan's in Jerusalem and you're in North Carolina. And somehow yes, you've been working together, correct, Dan? We have. I, I was uh, uh, really honored that uh, Joshua um, agreed to be an author in um, our recently published compendium called Israelophobia and the West, the hijacking of civil discourse on Israel and how to rescue it. Uh, Joshua is, um, uh, you know, one of the great young leaders of the American black community and, and, his, and his wife, whom I actually met in South Africa. She's a South African-born uh, lady. I, I met um, uh, Olga Meshway Washington well before I, I, I got to meet Joshua. And, and Olga, in her own right, is an intellectual. She's a South African intellectual whose father, um, Reverend Kenneth Meshway, is one of the most esteemed members of the South African parliament. Um, and, uh, and so it was through um, Reverend Meshway and, and, and his daughter Olga that I got to meet Joshua. So it, it, it it really has opened my eyes to uh, different um, aspects of this broader discussion, which you outlined so well, Mark, in a very teachable moment in your extended preface, which I think we all should play back and think about because we're really, uh, we're really facing a major challenge in the United States, North America, and around the world with regard um, to the, I would call it the post-George Floyd murder uh, environment. Yes, yes. Um Dan, hold on one more moment. I just want to make sure I, I've talked to Josh enough to understand 
what's going on here. You know, Josh, by the way, I met your wife. She's been on JBS. She is a lovely, extraordinary woman. How long have you been married? We've been married almost three years now. We're going on three years. Well, mazel tov to you. That's lovely. Thank you. Josh, when you heard my open and my description mm -hmm. of where Black Lives Matter is mm -hmm. and my characterization of what I believe to be the three flaws in the movement, what was your response? Um, you were right on point, Mark. Um, what's plaguing Black Lives Matter right now is the inability to let go of, of anti-Semitism, um, their obsession with Israel, and the, the hijacking. I mean, there, there, are some, there are some movements across the country where in the organization, in, in the leadership, there are not even black. Some of them are, are Palestinians themselves, you know, that, that have this, they, they do these anti-Israel, straight up anti-Israel demonstrations, you know, nothing to do with black lives. And some of them kind of merge the two together. Um, and, and they try to draw a parallel between what happened to George Floyd to, uh, what, to seemingly what IDF soldiers or, or Israeli police do to Palestinians. And it's been, um, it's, been a, it's been a difficult fight because that's been, that's been the messaging attached to Black Lives Matter since, since really uh, it first began after the, the killing of Trayvon Martin. Up until now, we've seen this kind of entanglement of Black Lives Matter and the, the so-called you know, Palestinian human rights activists trying, trying to parallel these things that aren't the same. Um, so no, you're, I think you're, you're right on point and, and it's, it's getting a little bit, it's getting more and more concerning because we also see that not only in the organization, so there's the movement for black lives, which has their charter, the official anti-Israel stance in their charter. And then you have the black lives matter movement, which, um, they don't share that charter, but they're closely linked to the organization. The founder of the organization also came up with the slogan for the movement. And you have a lot of leadership within the leadership of the Black Lives Matter movement, you have organizers who are avowed Farrakhan acolytes, um, who, who uh, are known to say things against Israel and the Jewish people here in the US. And the most concerning thing is that because I know that I, I know that there are members of Black Lives Matter who are good people, but there's no one in the movement that's really speaking out condemning or distancing themselves from the language. Um, and which which implies one that they either just aren't aware of what's going on or two for some of them they may actually agree with what's being said and they're you know just being silent about it because they know that it's really controversial um, and that's that's kind of the the bigger fight I think that we have too is the silent majority to all of this all right I want to delve into this more in one moment then I want to read what came out of the JCPA, and I'm, I assume you were involved in helping to write this, but it's when I saw this that I called you and said, would you do, uh, would you come on JBS with me? But I want to read the uh, two paragraphs of what your organization put out. I'm going to put it up on the screen for our viewers to see. You wrote, Boycott Divestment Sanctions, BDS, organizations have ratcheted up racial tensions and anti-Semitic agitation by accusing Israel of complicity in the Floyd murder. The BDS strategy is not new. The Jewish state has for some years been recast as an illegitimate, quote, white oppressor, unquote, state. Ongoing demonstrations across the United States have re-energized the intersectional solidarity between those protesting anti-black racism in America and BDS organizations' demands to, quote, free Palestine from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, unquote, a clarion call to dismantle the state of Israel. Dan, I want you to speak to that for a moment. There are two charges that are in the statements you made. One is that you're claiming in some way Black Lives Matter is accusing Israel of complicity in the Floyd murder. 
Do I understand you correctly? I would say partially, uh, and, and I'd like to clarify the text that I did write in this latest uh, jcpa.org published uh, brief. What, what, uh, where I like to uh, dis draw a distinction uh, based on the text that you just read uh, is that the, there, I have discovered a, an integration, as Joshua pointed out, between the rhetoric um, and the discourse uh, uh, that we see in hundreds since the May 25th murder of George Floyd, uh, of hundreds of demonstrations across North America, which have been appropriated in many cases by um, pro-Palestinian and uh, BDS organizations led by largely Palestinian Americans, such as professors Hatem Bazian of Berkeley, um, uh, Omar Barghouti, uh, Nora Arakat of George Mason University, um, and, and Rashid Khalidi uh, of Columbia has weighed in. And uh, what we see in this integration is a common use of language about Israel having, um, it, uh, number one, in, in which Israel is being referred to as a white supremacist country, colonialist, imperialist implant, an apartheid state, all of which, um, all of which suggest by definition that Israel need to be dismantled in the way that the same uh, discourse that is being led by some of the, um, the leaders uh, like Patrice Cullors of the, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, Matter is suggesting, and Mark Lamont Hill, who is sort of a, a spiritual, strategic, and intellectual leader um, in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, they're suggesting that uh, America, in some sense, should be dismantled, beginning with police forces, defunding, dismantling local governments. Uh, we saw in Seattle the Charlie's uh, 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 autonomous region, and, and they are uh, extending that demand, that mandate to dismantle to the entire state of Israel, number one. The, the, but the specific question you asked, Mark, about Israel's complicity has been made um, by, uh, in, in all of, in many of these um, protests and demonstrations that because there has been a charge that uh, Israel has trained in, in since uh, in counterterrorism, some of the law enforcement agencies in the United States that that actually makes Israel complicit in George Floyd's murder um, because the, these policemen in the United States, such as Derek Chauvin, who used this um, this neck, uh, this terrible uh, uh, neck press with his knee, was somehow, um, and this is a false charge, by the way, and very easily refutable, um, being, that was taught to them by the Israelis, where we know that those policies were in place years before there was any connection between Israeli counterterrorism advisors and American law enforcement agencies. Okay. Uh, one, last, one last quick point. The whole point of teaching American law enforcement at their request anti-terrorism is to help them with intelligence uh, as well as um, preventative measures so that another 3,000 Americans won't be murdered by radical Islamic terrorists they were, they were in Washington and, and New York on 9-11. So it, there's been a complete appropriation and distortion of, of the type of counterterrorism training that Israel has provided some law enforcement agencies to keep the American people safe uh, from the likes of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and Iranian-backed um, uh, terror militias. All right, I want to express to both of you the problem that's inherent in this discussion, and then I really am hoping both of you can help, help us understand it better. When I said that Black Lives Matter is a sacred cow right now in America, you understand it is. And it is almost heresy, American heresy, certainly on the left, to question anything about Black Lives Matter. And I know many young people, and again, I'm talking young from my perspective, they're 20, they're 30, they're 40. They may be in their young 50s even. They say to me all the time, show me anti-Semitism. 
I have it. They say to me, you know, I've been to countless Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter um, rallies. I have seen not one say a word about Israel. I haven't ever heard anybody get up at a podium with a microphone and say that Israel taught the Minneapolis police how to put a knee into somebody's neck. Never heard it. I don't hear any, when I go to these rallies that I'm in, I don't hear anybody saying Israel. I never hear the word Palestinian. And it seems to me, I'm, this is what I hear, it is maybe on the edges there are some individuals who are anti-Semitic or anti-Israel. But they tell me, I go on the Black Lives Matter website. There's not a mention of Israel anywhere. Anywhere. Now, there is a mention of Black Lives, uh, there is a mention of Israel on the 4BLM website. But they say to me, that's not Black Lives Matter. And even if they're, a, you know, some kind of umbrella group, it doesn't mean that everything in the 4BLM charter, and you have to really look for it, it's hidden inside a document, that just because it's there, it means that that's what the rank and file Black Lives Matter people feel, either about Israel or about Palestinians. And therefore, the sense they have is that this is seriously overblown. This is another case where Jews have to make it all about themselves and all about anti-Semitism and all about anti-Israel when there's no evidence of this staring us in the face. And I don't want to hear about what Black Lives Matter did or said in 2016. For these kids, that's irrelevant. They're saying to me, this is post-George Floyd, just as Dan just said. And in post-George Floyd, there's nothing in BLM's work in public that suggests as a movement, it is anti-Israel or anti-Semitic. By the way, I'm taking no stand here. At the moment, I'm expressing to the two of you what serious people feel. And I want to know what you would say. So, Josh, I begin with you. What would you say? Well, first of all, their messaging in both protests and on Twitter would contradict what they're saying because um, there, there have been multiple cases now that have been reported. San Diego, L.A., um, D.C., South Carolina, Seattle. Uh, Seattle. Seattle, yeah, where Black Lives Matter protests, uh, their chants were, went from uh, – police and, and things like that to uh, Palestinian issues. They, they chant that, Israel, we know you do it too. It's one of their chants. Um, they're, uh, I can't breathe. They, they're, they're drawings of IDF soldiers with their knees on Palestinian necks. Um, and, and there's this, like I said, there's this parallel drawn. All these things that, that, that I've been encountered with or that I've encountered these past couple of months have been in direct um, response to George Floyd, um, referencing him, referencing the knee thing, um, proliferating. So maybe there, you know, even if I, I'll concede that maybe, maybe there hasn't been an official speech given from someone at a, at a rally, it's, it's definitely embedded in their, in their protests. Um, in LA, like the, that is an example I just gave you, um, one of the, one of the organizers, she's a professor. She is, she's, gone to multiple Farrakhan events. She, she loves seeing him speak. She thinks he's a great man. And she talks about, um, and, and, and the protest turned into a riot, and it was in one of the oldest Jewish communities in that part of Los Angeles. Fairfax. Um, in Fairfax. Fairfax. Yeah, Fairfax County. Yep, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and so, th like I said, this was all in response to George Floyd. And I think that if you were to talk to other Black Lives Matter leaders, they would even contradict the ones that are saying, 
that there's no anti-Semitism in Black Lives Matter because the problem right now, and not just with Black Lives Matter, but even but in the Black community in general, is this tension between what really is anti-Semitic and what is quote unquote the, just the truth. Um, and so some people would say that they don't see any anti-Semitism in Black Lives Matter because they perceive what's being said as just a justice issue. They think that um, Israel really is committing genocide and it really is an apartheid state. And just like all the controversy that's been going on these past few days with a couple of NFL players, uh, Deshaun Jackson, Nick Cannon, saying these things about Jewish people, the problem is that a lot of black people see them as telling the truth and so they don't see it as anti-Semitic. Um, so it's their, it's their perception that that's really off. Okay. Dan, I want you to take a minute or so. I heard what Josh just said. It was very, very effective. What should the Jewish community of America's response be? Maybe it should be world Jewry. What should our response be right now? Take a minute or so and summarize for me. What should the Jewish community's reaction be, response be to Black Lives Matter and the fact that there is this anti-Semitic, anti-Israel strain inside it? Well, first of all, the, the Jewish community should restate, as I quoted them in the paper, that they have always stood, the Jewish community has always stood with the Black uh, leadership and community in the United States to fight racism. The Jewish community was the only minority community in the United States in the 1950s and the 1960s to shed its own blood on behalf of its brothers and sisters in the African American community at that time self-identified as the black community. Even D Dr. King even called it the Negro community. Um, but you know, Rabbi Joshua, Rabbi Abram Joshua Heschel was a colleague of yours uh, many, many years ago, Rabbi Golub. And, you know, the conservative and reform and orthodox streams of Judaism all stood shoulder to shoulder with the black community to fight racism and fought for the 1964 Civil Rights Act to be passed, which it ultimately was by President Johnson. Fast forward to today. Um, it, is a, it, it is an important a moment of social justice for the Jewish community to speak out against racism, against police brutality, and in favor of, of, of the rights and dignity of the black community. At the same time, there has to be a zero tolerance policy for the splitting of what they call legitimate criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism. This is a challenge uh, that, the, that the organized Jewish community has for itself because many in the organized Jewish community, and I think without proper homework, um, are launching uh, terrible condemnations of Israel for, for various policies Israel has without really knowing the context and not even considering when they call Israel an apartheid state, God forbid, or a genocidal or a war criminal or colonialist imperialist. The same language we hear in some of these um, demonstrations and protests in the name of Black Lives Matter, um, even though we don't see that particular language in the BLM mission statement itself, but the, the Jewish community has a difficulty standing up against that type of language because it plays into a similar type of criticism it has about the Jewish state. That's what, and all of this equals a new type of anti-Semitism, according to the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, it, which actually disavows, condemns, cancels out, delegitimizes, and dehumanizes the Jewish collective in Israel. It's a very difficult situation for Jews and for, as Joshua mentioned, and for the black community who don't think that they're doing anything wrong because they think that because there's so much propaganda and disinformation uh, flying around about the Jewish state that people are buying into this, unfortunately, um, without knowing that they're actually trading in, 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 in real, serious, virulent anti-Semitism. Josh, I often hear Jews say, how is it that the African-American community has negative feelings about Jews in Israel when Jews were in the forefront of the civil rights movements in the 1960s? And that... You know, it's not just that Heschel was walking arm-in-arm arm with King. 
it was rabbis and young people who were going down to Montgomery and Selma and they were getting their heads bashed open mm. and they were being, I mean, the reality is that Goodman and Schwerner are murdered along with Cheney in a ditch in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. right. And why has the black community seemed to forget all that the Jews did for the civil rights movement in the 1960s? I hear that all the time. And I wonder to myself, so I'm asking you, do you think that matters, that 1960 matters to young African Americans who are part of a Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, that 60 years later, mm. it's ancient history to most people, including to most African Americans. To what extent do you think African Americans are moved by the fact that Jews were there in the 60s? Or for Jews, that might be a significant part of our American history. But for the African American community, sorry, it just doesn't matter. So a couple of things. One, it, it definitely still matters. I mean, that's one of the things that we do at Ipsy is we, we educate because a lot of these things aren't um, as known in, in the black community. Um, we may know some more surface things, but to the extent uh, at which the Jewish community really stood with us and died with us, um, and, and they weren't even considered white either. I mean, back then, Jews weren't allowed in white colleges, and, right. and you know, uh, Jews had to... Um, go in some a lot of Jewish students learned in the HBCUs with black students because neither of us were allowed in white colleges so there was never really a thing of you know there's this debate about are you know are Jews the same as white people and well according to the white racists in the 60s no they weren't and um so that not only is that important but it's important because the, the context is important to see what how we became so anti-Israel and I think that Dr. King actually Kind of prophetically said it when he was at the rabbinical assembly and this was 10 years before 10 days before he was assassinated he said a lot of good things about israel but he also talked about the black community and he was talking about there there being a split in the community he said there are those of us who are color consumed and we see sort of a mystique in being colored and we see anything non-colored as being condemned and he was saying you know we don't follow that course here at the southern christian leadership conference and what he was talking about was the more radical, uh, the more radical wing of of the civil rights struggle, that was more aggressive, that were a little more divisive, and they were they saw things in terms of black and white, and so the what he was saying was the more you see things that way, um, he, the more that that it kind of skews your judgment. So when he talks about Israel, he talked about how there needs to be a plan for the Arabs in the Middle East to come to climb up the economic ladder and all those things. And uh, he said that, you know, if not, then there are going to be endless quests to find scapegoats. Um, and that's exactly what, not just in the Middle East, but what's going on here is that, you know, all the attacks that have happened uh, to the Jews in New York just the past few years, when, when you, the, the more heartbreaking thing than the, or just as heartbreaking as the events themselves were the justification by some of the black people there um, who were, just you know perpetuating the the conspiracies and the stereotypes about the jews and and them owning the banks and them you know controlling new york and all these things and and that's exactly what dr martin luther king was talking about when he said color consumed is that we some of us can't see seem to see past um what's in front of us or our, our own nose because all we see is white and black never mind the fact like i said that um jews were 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 struggling and, and disenfranchised just like we were in the sixties in the same, in the same way. And in other, in other areas, sometimes even worse uh, because they were Jewish, just like we were discriminated against because we were black. Um, those things are important because it also helps people to understand where we are now, um, how we got here and how some of the civil rights organizations that were very uh, friendly toward the Jewish people turned really quickly. 
Um, and, and so I, I recently wrote an article just kind of denoting that because there's one particular organization that was very pivotal. Um, and then it, it very quickly turned anti-Israel. And then very, very soon after that, it was pretty blatantly anti-Semitic um, and why that happened, how that switch happened. Um, and that's, that's, that's at the heart of it to me. It's, it's the color consumption because when you see things in terms of color, then that's all you see. And, and that makes you, that makes you believe anything that anyone tells you, as long as they paint people in the right color, you know, Josh, I have to make sure I understand what you're saying to me. Yes, sir. How old are you, Josh? I am 29. Okay. How many people, how many people in your community, mm. 29, 35, mm. know anything about the contribution the Jews made to the civil rights movement? If I were to say percentage-wise, in my community, maybe less than 10%. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's honest. Yeah. Yeah. And you may, by the way, that may be high. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And that's why I said to you, I don't think the fact that Jews were there mm. makes a difference now mm. to your community. And although you spoke eloquently, the bottom line is they don't know about it. And they don't know, and therefore they don't, it's not they don't care, right. but it, it has no relevance to them. Right. Right. And as a result, the Jew is, is right now, the Jew is lumped suddenly into the worst kind of white oppressor because he's oppressing the black Palestinian. Right, right. And that's what your community is dealing with. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Dan, you wanted to say. I, I just wanted to pick up on what you're saying now, uh, Mark, and what and Josh was saying is that, you know, Dr. King is a teacher for me, and he was a teacher for me when I was at Harvard College in the 1980s, and I, and I would read his letters. I read it in a course by the very famous Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Robert Coles, the, who, who uh, as you know, was, was well known in the black community for being a hero, for working with uh, Ruby Bridges, who was the first young black child to integrate the Mississippi school system. So Dr. King has always been a teacher for me. And Dr. King always said, it's not the color of your skin, it's the content of your character. And, um, you know, th this is critically important because Dr. King went to Harvard College in 1967, just a few days after Israel was forced to take um, uh, to, to counterattack the Jordanian bombing of Jerusalem. And he was um, in a roundtable with some black American students at Harvard. One of those students, as recounted in uh, Martin Kramer's book, um, uh, The War on Error, um, he recounts, based on an original account by Seymour Martin Lipset, that this uh, young black student who had uh, affiliated with the Black Panthers, and that was a much more extreme group that Joshua um, alluded to, in which if you listen today to Angela Davis, Professor Davis in California, she will say things about Israel being an apartheid state, about Israel you know, being a genocidal state. Well, this student said a similar thing in 1967 about the, you know, the, the dirty Zionist invaders um, and Dr. King cut him off, and he stood up and he said, don't go there, that isn't criticism of Israel, that's anti-Semitism. And you can find this quote in this exchange in, um, in Professor Kramer's book, The War on Error. Now, why I bring this up is that it is incumbent upon the leaders of Black Lives Matter. Many of their agenda in terms of anti-racism is, ven is, is, is venerable and honorable, and, and Joshua said that too. But it is up to them to do the same thing that Dr. King did, and that is to disavow anti-Semitism. When, when in the name of Black Lives Matter, people like uh, Minister Farrakhan says things that Jews are Satan. He said Jews are Satan. He said it now, not in 2016. He said it in these last weeks, and Joshua will confirm it. Mm -hmm. And when Angela Davis says similar things. And when and and uh, you know and when Patrice Cullors, one of the co-founders, says similar things, it is incumbent upon the the moral and um, intellectual leaders of that movement to disavow that anti-Semitic 
this uh, discourse in order to keep the purity of the Black Lives Matter agenda, just okay. like Dr. Oh. King did. And why, and why, I'm addressing this to either one of you, why is there no Black Lives Matter leader saying anything like you'd like them to say? Joshua? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that one of the biggest reasons is because, you know, people have been arguing to me that anti-Semitism is not a main, it's not the majority in the black community. And I would agree, um, but I would also say that it's, it's mainstream and it's, and it's growing. And I think that anyone who would speak out against it unequivocally would be seen as not being down for our cause. It's a very, it's a very uh, binary thing. So I don't know if you saw Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, um, NBA Hall of Famer, uh, the uh, Lakers, he wrote an article condemning some of the rhetoric that was coming, the, the, the Jew-hating rhetoric that came from Ice Cube and Nick Cannon and, and uh, NFL players. And um, from the black community, I mean, it, we, people, people were very split. People were just throwing all kinds of rocks at him and, and calling him all kinds of names and, and right. um, getting at him. And that's kind of what, that's what we're facing now here is that if there was a Black Lives Matter organizer that truly that that didn't understand what all this anti-Semitism was coming from, and they stood up and said, "Hey guys, we shouldn't have this as a part of our messaging," there's there's a lot of pressure um, to. First of all, I think that person would probably be forced out of that of that particular um, wherever they are in that group. But secondly, um, you know, it's now it's becoming more and more of a quote unquote right wing thing. To, to be pro-Israel or to even just even just to, to stop someone from, like Dan was talking about with Martin Luther King, to even stop somebody from, from spouting anti-Semitism would be seen as, you know, oh, so you're, for instance, Nick Cannon apologized for all the comments he made and he's been, he's been meeting with, with rabbis and he's been, you know, really trying to, and I don't, I, you know, it's hard to tell if he's sincere or not, but we'll see. But the problem is that a lot of black people are calling him uh, puppets of the yes. the Jewish agenda. So that that's kind of where it is. It's like, you know, if you do speak out, then you're being controlled. Okay, you know? and that's um, no, that's the pro that's what really, yeah, is the f most frightening aspect, of, and that's what really Dan's Dan was getting at through yeah. the JCPA, and yeah. what you're getting at, and you've and we've you know you finally identified it. And I'm sorry mm -hmm. that it took me so long to get there. You mm -hmm. helped me get there. Mm -hmm. But I had to have you say it. It's not, mm -hmm. It wouldn't be the same if I said it. The reality is that at the moment, the cultural ethic of the Black Lives Matter movement and the way it has now infected the black American community, especially, mm -hmm. again, within a certain circle the intelligentsia, the academicians, um, and the celebrities, and, you know, give Jabbar enormous credit for coming out, and he's someone who couldn't care less. They, could, they can't hurt him. Right. But the, what you just described is the real problem. The real problem is that in the black community, if you're not anti-Israel, if you're not pro-Palestinian in a way that denies Israel any legitimacy, you're seen, and I'm now using this phrase, you'll understand what you're at Uncle Tom. Right. And I'm even thinking to myself as you speak, what kind of slings and arrows, Josh, have you had to take? And has anybody said to you, oh, you're an Uncle Tom, you're, 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 you know, you're really white. Right, and you're right. really, none of that, you're married to somebody who cares about Jewish and you're, you've got a menorah. So you're, mm. you're uh, not only are you white, there's too much Jew in you. Right. And you're not right. an authentic <laughs> black mm -hmm. man. You're an authentic African-American. Right. Speak to that, Josh. Yeah, that's the problem we're facing. I mean, I, it's happened a lot either. Yeah, you you know, and, and by the way, people have thrown these kind of claims even back in the 60s at Dr. King, you know, they called him Jew boy and, and all those different things for, for his stance. But 
Um, so first of all, I, I'd like to think I'm in good company, you know, uh, but then secondly, um, yeah, there's very much a attaching your identity to this pro-Palestinian cause. I mean, there's extensive, you know, very much just propaganda, but, but scholarly writings on why black people should stand with the Palestinians and why we should stand against the evil, you know, Israeli occupation. And so there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's obviously it's false. And then like Dan said, a lot of these things can be debunked pretty easily, but there's a lot of, of quote unquote data to really back up this whole stance. And again, when you, when you're color consumed, it's easy because you see the Palestinians as our Brown, you know, brothers and sisters. And so, it's, it's not hard to kind of make that leap. And yeah, I've been accused of, of you know, working for the Zionist machine, uh, you know, getting paid to, to uh, be a, what's a Hasbara, uh, be a Hasbara person. And, and some of these terms I didn't even know until I got accused of, and I was like, what's Hasbara? And I would look it up. Okay, well, that's, I, I don't do that. I didn't even know what that was. And so, um, yeah, no, Information it's, it's, and propaganda. Right, right. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's that's what makes the fight difficult is that it's hard to have a conversation sometimes because um, the other side sees you as the enemy period um, or as a sellout or as, as a traitor. So even if you were to bring all the facts to them and, and all the evidence and show it, put it in their face, they'll dismiss it because oh, it's just Zionist propaganda, you know, and you're just, you're working for the Jews. So obviously you, you're off. Um, yeah. That makes it tough. By the way, Dan, there you have it. And I want to hear, you know, what's your perspective? What's your answer? And imagine this, Dan. Imagine, you know, some idealistic American Jew, mm-hmm. white, 30, 40. And they've been marching in the street since Floyd's death. And they think they're doing something really good for America and especially for the African American community, which has been f- dealing with racism forever. Mm-hmm. And right now, that's just the theme of the American counterculture. And they say, do I really, do I need to worry that my involvement, my empathy, my participation in the movement on the street, must I worry that in some way I am also jeopardizing the Jewish community? Or in reality, yes, you've described it, but it's, it's really separate from what's going on. And it's almost as if you're trying to undermine the validity of a movement in America that has its own validity, legitimacy, and noble purpose. What would you say to that young Jew, 20, 30, 40, even 50 years old? Mark, I think you raise a very challenging question because um, the, the Jewish soul has always expressed sympathy for the oppressed, for the downtrodden, for the exploited. And that's a deep part of, 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 of Jewish theology. It's a deep part of the Jewish Weltanschauung, the Jewish uh, worldview, and it's on our own experience. Uh, we were strangers in the land of Israel. It begins with, our, with the Bible. Egypt. However, you meant, you meant Egypt. Uh, is that what I said? I meant Egypt. You were strangers in the land of Egypt. Right. And, and yet, um, there has been an amortization at the same time over the last decades in, in, of Jewish identity um, increasingly disconnecting uh, that identity from the nation state of the Jewish people. And so the, the, Jewish, the Jewish community in the United States is facing a very difficult challenge. Will they sacrifice uh, the, the Jewish state on the altar of what has become um, pro-Palestinian political warfare against the Jewish state, appropriating in many cases the Black Lives Matter legitimate, honorable agenda against racism, 
in order to undermine and dismantle the Jewish state? Will they uh, will will they put the Jewish state on that um, you know on that uh, will they sacrifice the Jewish state for the for the other good of, of BLM? I don't think they have. I think they need to do both at the same time. But it requires a strength of character on the point on the part of young Jewish leaders and activists in order to understand that when they use this terrible language, Nazi language, apartheid South Africa language, genocidal language about the Jewish state, that is trading in anti-Semitism that leads to mass murder. And it happened 70 years ago from the, from the far right. And I fear that it is happening now today from the, Marxist, the neo-Marxist left, because the language that is being used Israel is fascist, Israel is imperialist, Israel as colonialist is the same language that Stalin used when he put Natan Sharansky, then known as Anatoly Sharansky, in jail for seven years because he wanted to go to the Jewish state. Okay, and then, then what do you want the young Jew to do? What I would like the young Jew to do is to, is to continue uh, the universal mission of tikkun olam, but I want the young Jew to become much more familiar with his own particular identity, which is inextricably connected to the to the Jewish to the Jewish homeland, to the Jewish state, and make sure that he and she knows when that uh, when th- when that aspect of their affiliation with their own history and their own future is being mortally threatened. Okay, forgive me. What does that mean in real life? There's a kid walking in the streets of New York or in L.A. or Chicago, and they think they're doing something good for America. And even in, as you talk, I don't want to talk about tikkun olam. You, you touched, I don't believe in tikkun olam, but I certainly believe in the Jewish ethic. And the Jewish ethic is as you've described. We care about anyone who is powerless. Okay, the kids in the street, what do you want them to do? Carry a book with him? Do you want them to enroll in some Jewish class in some synagogue somewhere? When you say he should learn about, what are you talking about, Dan? Well, this is, is the problem, by the way. This is the problem. It, look, the Jewish community has not figured out what to do with this young person who believes they're involved in a Jewish quest to make this a better country for all the oppressed at the moment they see that to be the African-American. So to say to them, and you want, be sure you know about your Jewish background. What's that mean? You know, it's, it's, it's a question of education. If he believes or she believes that it's the highest educational, spiritual, moral calling to protest and get on your knee for Black Lives Matter, but to sacrifice yourself, to commit suicide as a Jew when the discourse gets turned against you uh, and, and packaged as destroying the Jewish nation state, well, you've got a, you've got a huge problem. And, it, and it's a question of Jewish educators. What are parents going to teach their children? I, what are sorry, educators going to teach their children? I, I'm well, sorry. You know, emotionally, you know I'm with you a thousand percent. But what I'm now looking for is strategy. They don't hear this in the street. The, and Josh, the idea that this is everywhere, that Black Lives Matter everywhere in the country is, is just, every time you go to a rally, you hear how bad Israel is. It's not true. It does happen at times. But in most instances, it doesn't happen. And the kids who are listening to this, I used to say kids, they're adults. They're not moved by anything Dan is saying. And the problem is the American Jewish community, and I guess the world Jewish community, has not yet figured out how to deal with this insidious, insidious attempt to tear down and ultimately first to delegitimize and then to destroy the state of Israel. Any last comment you have, Josh? Yeah, so 
Um, it's, it's, it's twofold. One is something that I'm still trying to wrap my head around, and that is, you know, any, any other ethnic group, I think, outside of the Jewish community, I don't think we'd be struggling with whether or not we should ally ourselves with the group that has in its language things that are against us, even if it was just um, some sex in different parts of the country. That would, that would raise huge flags. You know, if, if, if the roles were reversed and it was a Jewish, Jewish Lives Matter group and another affiliate organization said some anti-Black things, we would look at that and say, okay, but those are your guys' affiliates. I mean, we would, we would make the connection so easily and we would distance ourselves because that's problematic. Um, and so, for, so two things. To me, that shows, like Dan was saying, the heart of the Jewish community to the fact that we're still that they're discussing and debating amongst themselves whether or not we should still be affiliated with this group, even though we know that uh, they have very anti-Semitic uh, teachings in their in their language, um, is it's just that's incredible. I said it's also mind-boggling because, I mean, just personally, I wouldn't do that. I, I don't think anyone I know would 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 do that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I want to say to both of you. This is what I believe the real problem is. And I've been saying this to many people. Uh, I'm very close to a woman named Noreen Krasnagor, who has been done wonderful work within Connecticut, trying to defend the state of Israel and to fight all forms of BDS and any assault on Israel. And I'm saying the same thing to her. The biggest problem we have right now is identifying this in clear, unequivocal terms for people who would be moved if it were in their face. It's not in their face. They don't encounter it. And therefore, it's very hard for them to believe it's real. And we have to make sure we can show how it's real. And, you know, Dan, you and I spoke before we started this program. I said to you, my biggest problem is you're going to have to give me proof because without proof, it doesn't move people. So I hope people are now listening to you, Dan and Josh. They've heard what you have to say. You have said it so well and so honestly. I hope they come away at least now wanting to learn more. Because the bottom line is there is within Black Lives Matter leadership, movement, and philosophy an anti-Israel, an anti-Semitic strain, and most people don't get it. Thanks to you, at least now, the sort of the, yeah, the can has been opened, and now people are going to take a look. So I am very grateful. I wish I had two hours with you, but Dan and Josh, thank you so much for making this, you know, possible, this discussion possible, and we will continue, Dan, part two very, very soon. I thank you for making sure this happens, Dan. Kol tuva hatzlacha to both of you, my best to both of you. Thank you both. Thank you very much. It was thank very so instructive. The thoughts of Dan Diker, Director of the Political Warfare Project at the JCPA, the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, and Joshua Washington, Director of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. I hope it's not that you've enjoyed hearing them, but they've both given you more insight into the dangers inherent in the Black Lives Matter movement for Jews and for the state of Israel. My thanks, as always, to our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golub, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Stay safe and be well, my friends. <laughs>